any questions or reflections or ideas of yours. It's a lot of brain food in there, but hopefully some stuff to, yeah. I was just on a course in Sedona for this moment, and I had a quote pop in my head, um, John Burrell, John Pierre Burrell, I don't know if you've heard of him, but his whole philosophy is everything's connected. His theory is you don't go and treat something, you listen to the body, and he teaches a technique to go in. And the quote he always says is you just have to change a little something, right. and that just pop forward yeah. you. And sometimes it's just how you are in relationship to something. I'm curious if people have experiences of, um, of touching into that animist way of being. You have stories of being in relationship with the world. Well, what, what came up for me a lot, Sarah, was the, uh, what I do within meditation and with what I do with meditation on the table with clients. And it, it's about being and it's about exploring and it's about calling on your own inner healing so with that work, it seems to be more internal. But what I found really interesting about what you were saying is bringing it forth into your external world and living through that lens. I thought that was fascinating, but I was relating to it mm -hmm. from an internal meditation. One of my teachers, Dana Metzger, Dina Metzger, talks about the fact that for a healing gesture to be truly healing, such as two body workers here, to be truly healing, it has to be healing at every level. So it has to... It has to work at the micro, it has to work at the level of the organs and the organ systems, it has to work at the macro, it has to work all the way through. And if it doesn't work at all those levels, it's not truly healing. So I think that speaks a little bit that, that there's a scaling of that. Anybody else? Any other? Yeah. I'm curious what practices um, are most inspiring for you that help connect with other than humans, especially in nature. Speaking, talking, okay. yeah, and, and David Abram talks about the difference between talking to and speaking with, mm -hmm. that there's a really clear differentiation, that speaking with is a call and response, and a call and response, and I mean, even for me, sometimes it's just little mind games, like looking at the tree and thinking, the tree's looking at me, How, can I actually allow that thought to really be true in me, to really register that that tree is seeing me with the same degree of interest or not interest or something that I'm seeing it. So just like, it's almost like mental gymnastics of trying to think those thoughts and trying to experience what is it to be seen by a tree? And if I speak to that tree and then, and then pause and see what the tree might be speaking back, and that sometimes the nature of the thing is its speech. So a bird, it's in movement or it's color or something. It's a different language. And then the other really key one for me is ritual and offerings and um, gift giving, right? whether it's gifts of tobacco or cornmeal or water or a coin or a poem or a song or some, something that says, just like we do with humans, I, I, I want you to be happy. I want you to enjoy this. I do this for you on your behalf. And it starts to open things up. It's, it's back to this question of how do we become the ones the spirits trust? And I think that's about reawakening a kind of trust that takes a little bit of cultivating, back and forth and back and forth. It's been a while. And in the Healers' Council, we work with a bundle of stones. And people who've been in the council will know this, that those stones, it's now been three years we've been working as a group with the same bundle. And when we first invited these stones to be part of the process, the very clear message from these stones was, OK, but don't you be messing around. Like, this is real. We'll, we'll show up. But this is, this is not to be taken lightly. If you're going to start this, don't stop it. It was like they were demanding our trust. They were checking to see if they could trust us. And so those kind of back and forth, you give a little and then you give a little. You give a little more and they give, and then you can go further and further. It, it, it's a growing process. Peg. I have a, a really, I'll just share this just as a note. 
Yeah, I'm totally funny, but it is kind of funny. But I was, uh, my partner and I were in uh, Souk for a month, and we kind of go there once a year for a week or two. So far as came at the same time, and I was um, having a friend do a healing touch treatment on my back from Calgary, and that was fine. That was all arranged, and so I was talking to this other friend of mine who was in a unit up the up the way, and she said, "Well, why doesn't she just Facetime you?" And I said, "Well, that's not no, that wouldn't work." <laughs> Her whole solution, she could not grasp. The concept, and she said, "You're nuts! Like, like, just for FaceTime, like, just talk to her. Like, <laughs> like, she could. How would you, how would you start to, to sort of? I don't know. You know th this. <laughs> <laughs> so, if your question didn't come through, that it's about experiencing a distance healing yes. that's happening, and trying to explain that to someone who who just can't." find a frame where distance healing can be real, and the only thing they can find is FaceTime to connect that. And I actually don't spend very much time trying to convince people. I, I find that's not a particularly useful use of my time, because it's, it's not, you know, there's a difference between believing and experiencing. And believing is kind of an abstract. Do you believe it or don't believe it? Well, that, that sort of lives up in the conceptual. But if you can have an experience, then it's not, it's not even a question of believing or not ex believing. And we often need to learn to keep trusting our experiences because we've been told not to believe what our bodies say and not to believe what we think and not to believe what we feel and to, to put these frameworks on top of it. So if there's a way to help someone have an experience if they're so inclined, that I find is much better than trying to convince them. Yeah, Jane. Yeah, and I think that's building on that question. So the question we were talking about during the break at the Healers Council uh, in January. And, you know, I was asked, we've been talking about fairies and the other world and other beings, and someone asked me the question, well, you know, how, how is it to live in relation with those? And I was stunned that I didn't answer the question, because the question for me is, how can you not live in relation <laughs> with other beings? Right. And so to try and explain what it is to live with them, I. I I couldn't explain that because I couldn't imagine not having grown up in a culture where we talked about fairies as, as much as anything. Oh, the grass is green. Oh, yes, there's a fairy circle. Oh, this or that. So to to talk about how do I not live? You know, how do I live with them? It's hard for me because it would be really how do I not live? With them? And that's the when the fairies are so normal. And you know, we talk, I remember that conversation yeah. about you growing up in England. And that just the fairies are part of it. They're part of the community. They're part of who's there. When it's so normal, that's when the fish doesn't see the water it swims in. And that's that's kind of the dream of being able to get to that place where it just is normalized. Yeah. Um, I often think about the concept of ancestors because oftentimes we limit ourselves to just the human realm. But long before humans were as we are now. There were our predecessors that became us eventually. So I think if you go back in time to the, to the ancestors uh, as being pre human as well, it really starts off as a protozoan. So truly, we actually are literally all connected. Yeah, yeah, but that tree. And so we can tap into those memories and those different ways of thinking because that's the source that we've come from. We're still connected to it. And then it's in our cells, Correct. it's in our bodies, our There's physical bodies. And that not only are we related and direct descendants from those ancient ones, pre-human evolutionary, mm -hmm. but our ancestors, in a way you can say, well, the carrot that I ate for lunch is part of my ancestry. It's, it's what makes me possible. It's what gives me life. Right? So it's, it's even more immediate than that. But yes, certainly expanding our sense of who we're related to and who we are, really critical. Jennifer and then Jen, Jimmy. Well, Back to some of these other body workers' um, <clears throat> comments. I um, recently did some training in craniosacral. I'm cra now a therapist, but learning how to feel subtle rhythms inside and say, where is that vertebra? Where is that? Where's that kidney? Where is that? And, and really trying so hard to like penetrate into the body to get 
And then, you know, sort of finding the way that, in fact, when I stopped doing that and really believed in that animistic way, that, in fact, it's already there. It is probably trying to contact me. <laughs> and, you know, kind of at the same time, I was having these kinds of experiences in nature where I would say, I'm going to go connect with nature now. And I went out to this grove of trees and I said, you know, I'm here, kind of thing. And they're like, whoa, like, <laughs> chill out. Like, it's not about you doing that. Just maybe their message for me is go inside or something, anyway. But that they appeared to me. I didn't actually, my way of approaching that task was so um, sort of crude compared to yeah, what's, what I'm learning to kind of perceive now. And that nature, and that tuning into a person's body, and tuning into the bigger nature outside is the same thing. And so human nature, like the nature within us, has been, a, has been such a, a big, exciting shift in, in perception and understanding. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And that it's, that it's there, we just have, have shut down the capacity to connect with it. And we don't necessarily taking a Western, like, okay, here I go, here I am, is different than just, oh, I just, I just release the things that got in the way. And if I can release those, then the connections can be more clear. like such a beginner in this world and in, in this world view and uh so a couple of years ago when my yard was struck by lightning and i came to you my husband sent me to you <laughs> to say make her make sense of this <laughs> what is this all supposed to mean and um i remember sort of me explaining it to you saying she think it could be this or that and, and am i crazy to believe this or that and your words were uh, if you could just sort of step out of what you believe or don't believe, but if, if you knew this to be so, how would you be in this world? And I've kind of tried to live by that, and that's, you know, if that was the medicine coming to me long before I was able to see it or know what it was for, um, it's helped me move in that direction to just imagine who I would be if I knew that would be so. If you knew this to be so, who would you be? Dina talks about living in the fifth world, that we actually need to consciously step into that realm and start living by those rules. And it's, we can't bridge the two. We just need to start living there. And when we start living there, then things become possible. There's another hand over here. Let's see, Patty. I just wanted to know if, uh, if you've heard through the grapevine from your Sangoma teachers in Africa uh, about no water for 400 mm -hmm. or for 4 million people in Cape Town, mm -hmm. Cape Town. Yeah. because this is a yeah. real yeah. big thing and I, I know there's lots of Sangomas probably mm -hmm. working on this. I no, I haven't. Yeah, I don't know. And I think there'll be more of that in its various iterations. No, I don't know. I'd be curious. It's an interesting question. Yeah, I'm not connected to them anymore when I was living. Yeah, <laughs> California's not that far. Yeah that our relationship with all those elemental beings is, yeah, is deeply out of whack. And there's, a, there's an understanding, and there's a, a couple of Western practitioners who wrote a book, I think it's called Weather Medicine. They're talking about the elemental beings and the elements being the forces of the weather and weather being related to emotions and that the disoriented and discombobulated weather patterns are in some ways related to, it's not a direct causality, but our kind of lack of skill at dealing with our own emotions. That we block and flood and we don't have tools for grief and anger and so those things come out in different ways. So it doesn't necessarily speak exactly to that situation, but there's some, there's some big pattern out of balance. And that idea of weather and emotions being connected has always been interesting to me. Another question for you? Please. Um, so I was living on a small hill island a few years ago. I spent a lot of time in the forest and having some cool connections with some other than human beings and like elven creature that I never really saw. And somehow it came to me that they like sparkly things. Mm -hmm. So I ordered a hundred of these like rainbow making balls from some website in China. Anyway, the postal system isn't very good there and um, my name's Micah and those are 
person we are in Indonesia. So there's this kind of mix up, and I never got involved, and I ended up leaving the island, and I was like, all oh, these Chinese companies screwed up, and I, I never got it. these sparkly things, and I can put them in the forest for the elves to enjoy. Um, <clears throat> but when I was visiting the island a couple years later, I learned, number one, this woman who was really dear to the community there had, had died of cancer. And number two, the box of crystals had arrived and had gone to this person, Misha. And at the funeral, um, she got this box, she didn't know what so she brought it to the funeral and distributed these sparkle rainbow balls to all the people that I have to love this woman. So now they're in all these people's windows, like, really enjoying magic. And, and so that story for me is like when I put energy into connecting with the spirits and other like they they take the magic that from that energy to it to where it needs to go. That that is a beautiful story. That that how we show up. And I experience this again and again when I'm working in ritual space with dying people and their families. If we create a container that is so my work is about to actually essentially taking the animus transpersonal lens to death and dying. And rich on how do we create this container where all these things are alive and honored and connected? The world just starts talking back. Mm -hmm. Things happen. We walk through the field and the hawks circle around us, and people show up, and magic things happen. And these synchronicities are, are maybe not so much synchronicity, but as you say, you, you feed something into the system that follows these principles, that feeds the system, and the system blossoms that, and something new comes back. It's it's not sometimes that hard to do, to make just the little ones happen, and then you do it more and the bigger ones happen. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any last comments or questions? Um, I have a, a story to share as well. Um, I have a lot of good threads in this story. But um, there's a book by David Oakford. He's a guy who, when he was very young, he did some dangerous drugs and he had a near-death experience. And a being showed him the world from another dimension. Mm -hmm. And he saw many, many interesting things. But one thing he saw was wherever there is civilization, Gaia's energy is kind of muted. And what he noticed was people ought to be the, the brightness or the light mm -hmm. wherever um, construction happens or asphalt or whatever. But it seems that when people are so unhappy and discouraged, their light is muted as well. So there's kind of a, in a sense, an obligation to be happier um, for Gaia's sake. Um, with that in mind, I was, um, I think I spent most of my, well not most, but half my life, um, whenever I was alone, I was just thinking, well, I'm just on this rock of the earth, there's nothing really alive or awake here. It's me. Um, but over time, you get shown different things where you realize that's not the case. Um, in any case, I uh, started to meditate outside on the ground. And I also happen to have, um, I, I do work with, uh, in the courts. One day I had to go into the court and find someone, and they said, when you open the door, <clears throat> you have to nod to the judge. And I thought, well, I'm not going to nod to the judge. They're not even going to notice me. But they do. And so when I go outside of my house, I kind of do that acknowledgement. So when I did this very profound meditation between these trees, um, I, <clears throat> I invented a prayer of my own for um, that purpose of acknowledging Gaia and bringing light. Um, and when I was done, um, a deer came thundering by, three feet away. That's not so yeah. Beautiful. I think it's. <clears throat> Even narrative structure in Western culture has a beginning, middle, end kind of wrap-up point. And stories like that and the story you told are different kinds of stories. They, they don't have 
bang, 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 and thus is the meaning there. In, and it's, in a way, it's, they're sometimes they're hard to tell in this culture, but we almost need to learn those new kinds of narrative structures to say, oh, it's, it doesn't have a point to it, and I can't say what, but this and this and this are all related in some way, then the relationship is not linear, we can't explain. But when you, when you experience, you can feel it, and when you tell it, we can feel it. So it's almost like dreams. Dreams put things together. It's a beautiful story, and, and I think a practice in, in telling stories that way. One, one thing I wanted to throw in was um, I could grasp the idea in a way that um, I can look at nature, nature can see me or look at me. Um, but that's a little too science fiction -y. Like it's kind of like looking into a camera, the camera can look at you as well, right? What I wanted to throw in was it didn't occur to me until that point that manners are involved. That's the core of it. Manners are involved. And that's ritual protocol. That's walking respectfully in the world. That's nodding to the judge. That's saying hello to the sun every morning. That's thanking the water you before you drink it. It never ceases to amaze me that the same basic relational tools work like healing gestures. They work at all the levels. If you're polite and respectful and honoring and say please and thank you and how are you? And do you like this? Oh, do you like that? It's, it's like any other kind of relationship. Manners are really our core. Well, thanks for that. All right. Okay, I think we'll wrap up here. Um, but I really want to thank you all for coming. It's, it's such a thrill for me to to be able to put these ideas into words and to support the Healers Council and the work we're doing there with this kind of work, but also to explore and, and see people interested in, in learning about this. So I really, you know, talked before that students make the teacher. Having people come to hear me talk about this is an incredible gift, and it actually allows me to find the words. So thank you for being part of that. And I invite you to join us. We've got tea and cookies back there, lots of nice folks to chat with. Introduce yourself to someone you don't know, and um, thanks again for coming. <laughs> to the cookie table. <laughs> <laughs>